What is author marketing mastery through optimization, you ask? I'm going to tell you. It is absolutely, bar none, the best way for authors to make a living selling their books. Are you tired of feeling like you have to be on social media 50 hours a week just to sell a few books and then frustrated when that time doesn't actually lead to any book sales? Are you tired of hearing people say that you just have to be patient with the social media game for a long time so that you can build that following and that trust? Yeah, I was too, because there's only one of me, and ammo solves that problem. Now, here's the deal. It's a system that can actually guarantee results, and I'm not the one doing the guaranteeing, and I don't think that Steve Piper, who founded Ammo, would literally say that it's a guarantee, but what's a guarantee here is that when you spend advertising dollars in a right way, you get results and you're profitable. Okay, the concept here is if you spend a dollar and make two, you are profitable. And Ammo does that for its authors. I want you to check out the link in the show notes because this program has the ability to change your life. And hey, it's not for everyone. If you're a traditionally published author, it might not work for you because your margins will be too small to get profitable advertising on your own. That's something you'll have to take up with your publisher. But if you're self-published, if you're indie published, this thing could be great for you. If you have a few books out, especially if you're a series writer, this is a game changer. The whole podcast is now part of the Ammo family. So you'll notice every Wednesday, this show is Ammo Edition. But even on Mondays, you're listening to a show that exists because this author, this host of the podcast uses Ammo and makes money selling books. It's a beautiful feeling. I encourage you to check it out. Full disclosure, I was planning on talking with you on today's episode about using libraries to leverage your authorly dream, uh, the process of building relationships with librarians. Uh, We're going to get to that episode here at some point. I've had kind of a rough outline in my mind of the territory that I want to cover, but I am personally in the middle of a little project right now that is fully about libraries. Uh, And so instead of trying to talk about something that I'm not focusing on with libraries, I thought I would just take you where I'm going. This is what I'm focusing on right now. So I hope that you will permit me to just give you something that is otherwise pretty far out there into ultra experimental territory. Um, This one is going to fit in your wait and see category most likely. Thanks to Rich Hosek for that idea. He says, I am really great to listen to because I will go through all of the failure for you so you know not what to do. That's That's right. I mean, I don't know anybody else who's trying different things and seeing what works. So I'm trying to be that person and document my experience for you in many cases. With that in mind, we are going to discuss something that I have been calling Books for Bruce. If you've ever watched an author read in public and felt bored, TRBM is the antidote. That reminds me of the great Canadian tundra where we had to protect ourselves from the elements and flying hockey pucks. TRBM is for writers, what time lapse was for painters, what guitar solos and spotlight were for bands, and what chainsaws and ice blocks were for sculptors. What does TRBM stand for? Total Recall Before Midnight? Turmeric Raising Bengali Maidens? Or the Rowdy Blunt Merriman? You decide. It's Books for Bruise. That's right. It's Books for Bruise. Not B-R-U-I-S-E, like a punch in the face, but Bruise, B-R-E-W-S. If you know me, you know I enjoy having the occasional beer, but this brew is going to be coffee, tea, kombucha, and, yeah, beer. So all four drinks, there might be other things that are brewed if I find out along the way, then I can maybe add that into my list of brews. The idea came from a sleepless night, much like the one I had uh, on Monday. I think it was Monday. Anyways, I I, I lose track of the episodes. I recently had a couple of sleepless nights. This one was on the longer of the two. Or maybe it was even before that. Shoot, I don't remember. Days all just kind of flow together for me right now. But at any rate, I, I was thinking what I'd really love to do is get my own 
hometown engaged in some kind of effort to help me get higher on the Amazon bestseller list. I've always figured that if I can climb the rankings and maybe even be number one in the mystery hard-boiled category for just like even 20 seconds, that Amazon would probably promote my books organically a little more robustly. I figured that would maybe turn into a long tail of decent sales if I could do it. And so I thought, what if I ran a promotion on my book and I sold it for 99 cents? And then I went door to door. I mean, I've tried that before. It worked great, right? So, I mean, but I did think that this was an idea and and I'll go door to door and be like, hey, I'm selling my ebook for 99 cents. But what I realized, what you already knew, what most people know, but I have to fail at at least once to agree that I know it too, is when you want people to act, there needs to be a sufficient motivation for them to act. It has to be something that's beneficial. You are going to run into people in your life who get really high on altruism. And altruism is just that feeling of doing good for somebody else. Oh, it makes you feel so good. But there's not too many people who are truly altruistic. So it's not often going to work that you're just going to be able to knock on someone's door and say, hey, wouldn't you love the feeling of helping an author along his way? Give me a buck and I can get higher on the Amazon bestseller list. You could also go door to door and try to get them the good feelings and motivate them by saying, hey, I wrote this really great mystery book and it's a mystery you'll never see coming in a thousand years. For one, I don't know if that's actually true, but for two, well, about the mystery, you know, like I'm not real good at surprises. Anyways, I'm getting off track. The point here is you go, you give your pitch about how great your mystery is and the person looks at you and says, yeah, but I don't read books. Okay, well, would you buy it because you know that it's a great mystery and you want to support somebody in your community? Blah, blah, blah. You're right back to the same place. People don't want to do something if there's not a benefit in them, benefit in it for them. And so they're not going to, you know, buy the book. You slowly start to come to the reality that even if you ran a free promotion on your book, which There's no benefit in a free promotion if you can't get reviews. But even if you ran a free promotion on your book, you would still get fewer than one in 10 people who would choose to download the book. I know this. I know this because I have tried similar things before. So I will talk to you about a great strategy I've used on Twitter that gets people to download the book and you can get some email addresses. But as of right now, that strategy is not turning into book reviews. And so even though I'm giving away a significant number of books for free, I'm not getting a lot of reviews on the 8-Ball Magic of Suzy Q, which is a great time to say, if you have the book, if you're reading the book, go ahead, drop a review. Thank you to Angel. She bought the book and reviewed it. Thank you to Heather. She bought the book and reviewed it. And one of the readers from the Twitter promotion, read and reviewed The 8-Ball Magic of Suzy Q. If you have it, if you've read it and you're waiting to leave your review, don't wait anymore. If you have it and you haven't left a review, now's the moment. Crack it out, break that spine, and just dig in because it is juicy. (laughs) All righty. So if you don't have sufficient motivation, you're not going to do anything. So trying to lean on the goodness of your town's heart is going to be a no-go. And I wanted to give you a concrete example where I was the bad guy in a situation or kind of the bad guy in a situation because, well, you know that Xe Sands is the audiobook narrator for the Nine Lives of Margaret Long High and the Eight Ball Magic of Suzy Q. And I had the opportunity to speak with her on the phone for just a little over an hour a while back. It was a wonderful conversation. She is a truly amazing person. We share so much in common, like political views. How often do you talk to a stranger about politics and feel like safe and comfortable? Well, we had a great time. And we talked about cities and city infrastructure. And we were really aligned on how we thought about things. It was so cool. 
And then she told me that she was a podcast addict. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. So am I. I'm always looking for new shows because right now I'm fully up to date on Joe Rogan. I'm fully up to date on Dax Shepard. I'm fully up to date on Lex Friedman. I'm fully up to date on and on and on. And I'm like, there's just not enough shows that I love that I always have something to listen to. So sometimes I find myself experimenting and listening to stuff that doesn't resonate and, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Point is, I asked Dexy, what are the podcasts you love? Because I'm always looking for new shows. And she had such a long list. She's definitely an addict for podcasts. She loves listening to them. And so in a, in a future email, she sent me about 20 different shows that she loves. And I started listening to them pretty quickly. And what I realized was at least the ones that I went through, and there were, yeah, I think I tried like six or seven before I thought, huh, I might not be listening to the same podcast she is. She really likes fiction podcasts, and this is a good moment to mention Rich for the second time because I did give a shout out to his show, Insomnia. Oh, <laughs> Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. I always do that to him. The show is Bedtimes. <laughs> The show is bedtime for insomniacs. You're welcome, Rich. <laughs> uh, and and his show, I do really, really love. But the ones that I was listening to had maybe too many voice actors. It seems like XE really liked more going on. And there were dinging bells and doors and things. I don't know. It just, I didn't, all the ones that I tried, they couldn't quite get into. Fiction podcasts. I guess it's not my thing. So I gave it a try. Uh, but when it came down to it, I didn't make the buy, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't buy into it. And so you might find that when you're trying to do something, like sell a book in your town and pull on people's heartstrings and all the different things you do, that you can maybe get people to take one action for you if there is a sufficient reason to. Just because they're like, you know what? I love the city of Oakland, Nebraska. There's a local author. I'm going to support him by downloading this free book. Getting them to read it, no way, unless they actually like fiction. Getting them to leave a review, out of the question, even if they like fiction, but your book doesn't do it for them. So there's all of these barriers to success. And the reason I bring that up is because the Books for Brews idea came from this place of thinking, okay, I need to find a way to A, get my message out to people who actually want my message. B, I need to give them a sufficient reason to take my book when they could take any other mystery author's book over mine and they don't know me. And C, I need to build a list of people that like me enough that I might possibly be able to turn that book into a review. Because here's the thing, and this is the plan. But before we get there, give me just a second. There's also an example of when the message hits right. And that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Dax Shepard. I feel like he's my personal friend. And if you listen to Armchair Expert, you might too. People who listen to his show oftentimes get the feeling that he's just one of us. He's one of the guys, one of the people. He's in this group of every person. You, you just, you feel comfortable with him. And Dax makes a good deal of money just by reading ad copy for different businesses. So he and Monica, Monica is his co-host, they read ads for McDonald's. Great, I love McDonald's. And for some reason, ever since he's been reading ads for McDonald's, I feel a little bit better about like eating McDonald's. But the one that's notable here is there was a period of time early on when I was listening to him and I hadn't discovered a lot of other podcasts and I had hundreds of shows to catch up with. He was doing an ad for Chrysler Pacifica. My wife and I needed a minivan. Ours was about at the end of its rope. And I seriously was searching everywhere to try to find a Pacifica that I could buy because Dax had read an ad for it. So that's the power of a motivation when everything aligns is that I liked him. I needed a minivan. I was looking for a minivan, whereas I wasn't looking for a fiction podcast. This one's tough because I don't want to make it sound, well, whatever, draw your own conclusions. What happened was I wanted the Chrysler Pacifica. 
I still didn't buy it though. And you can draw your own conclusions about that as well. I had a huge influence over me about that stupid minivan. Okay, so you see both ways that it can work. Then let's recap. The grand idea is to offer my book for a brew. That's coffee, tea, beer, or even kombucha. And I'm seeking to partner with area businesses in Omaha. So I'm going to set up a table inside and offer my book in exchange for a tasty cup of goodness. Once I have three to five businesses who agree to run the promotion with me, I'm going to send a press release to KETV. That's our local news station, television-wise, uh, as well as the Omaha World Herald, maybe Omaha.net, and any other local media outlets that I can find, letting them know that this is happening, that I have partnered with these businesses, and that I will be offering a copy of my book in exchange for a brew. I don't have any idea what I'm going to price the books at, if I'm going to do a screaming deal, how I want to approach it, how I can avoid losing tons of money by doing it. Because if I want to make sure that I buy the brew, then I have to make sure that the book either covers the cost of the brew or that the company that I partner with gives me some kind of discount so that I'm able to sell the books a little more cheaply. I don't know what the formula is going to look like, but first I need to get the businesses. And that's I guess a stopping point along the way is when you have ideas like this, you might be the kind of person who's like, oh, there's going to be 55 problems if I do this and I'm not going to even worry about it until I have uh, sussed out all the different problems that might possibly come up because I wouldn't want to put myself in a situation where I had to spend $500 for a mistake. And I'm like, well, I bet you went to college. A lot of you did. If that wasn't a mistake, I don't know what is a mistake. College is uh, a big mess of hooey. <laughs> There's no good reason to go to college anymore. Go ahead, write me an email, tell me why I'm wrong, but I'm sticking to it. So, okay, <laughs> lose $500 on an idea. It's not the worst thing that's ever happened. You'll have real life experience and you might build some relationships along the way that'll make you a lot more than $500 in the future. Uh, or at least maybe they'll buy you a beer the next time they see you or a coffee if you don't drink beer or you get the point. Okay, kombucha. So, <laughs> alrighty. So you partner with the businesses, then you send out your press release. The businesses benefit because they get a, a free spot on TV or in the newspaper, maybe both online. They're getting free promotion from you. So you probably can get them to discount their products a little bit. You can sell your books cheaply. You're still going to have to buy paperbacks probably to arrive at these events with enough paperbacks to sell for people who don't want an ebook or an audiobook, which just while we're here, there's a lot more margin in digital goods. So I love to move people that direction when I'm thinking exclusively about money. But when I'm thinking about just relationships, there ain't nothing better than a paperback. People really, they just, they feel differently about paper books. Paper, 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 boo, ba, ba, da, boo, paperback books. In a realistic world, if I can get my three to five partners, then I am going to have a chance to move a you know, reasonable number of books uh, and get some email addresses, build some recognition in my own town. Uh, if I do it well, I might climb the Amazon bestseller ranks to a point where it's worth taking a screenshot of my climb and saying, hey, look how high my book made it in this particular category. It's worth the effort to try. And who knows? I mean, if Andy Weir can go from, you know, nobody knows his name to writing The Martian and getting to shake hands with Matt Damon and see his character played by Matt Damon, then I figure you could always hope that something unrealistic happens. If you just keep putting yourself in a certain space, Maybe eventually it, you catch on. Maybe you catch fire. Maybe somebody gets really excited. If the right somebody likes what you've done, chances are you've made your splash. So yeah, am I hoping for that? Absolutely. Would I love to sell uh, an absurd number of books, uh, make a profit on the books for brews, and end up being uh, a celebrity around the country? Um, yeah, Definitely. Let's do it. I, in fact, I'll let you know, I sent a pitch to Alexander Payne, who directed Nebraska, who directed uh, Sideways, who directed great 
movies that everybody loves. And when I'm on the spot, I never remember most of the things that I want to remember. But Alexander Payne would be awesome. What if he directed my movie? What if he thought uh, my book? <sighs> Sheesh, I'm going too fast, guys. Let's slow down a little bit. What if Alexander Payne decided my story was good enough to make a screenplay of and turn into a movie? That would be just so gratifying. It'd be a little bit of money for me, I think. But moreover, can you imagine seeing uh, Detective Luke E. Mia on the big screen? Can you imagine seeing Lau Kapuchnik? I can't even, it's just too big. It'd be amazing. So these are the kinds of things that you do that are experimental and you, you hope they work. But let's be clear on one thing. Books for Brews may be a good stepping stone or open some doors for some financial opportunities where you can make a full-time living as an author. In fact, we're getting there because I absolutely believe that's the case. But if you think that you're going to pick up all of your worldly possessions, hit the road, and start just doing books for brews in all 50 states... Well, you probably want to think about the actual financial implications because if you have to sell a book and then give a coffee, give a beer, give a kombucha. I don't know why I'm so stuck on kombucha today, but I am. If you have to give one in exchange for your book, it's going to eat almost all of your margin, if not a little bit more than all of your margin. I expect to walk away from an event like this having spent money, not made it. But I could be wrong. I'm just saying, don't expect like a book for a brew to be that kind of thing where you're like, hey, this is a business model because it's not a business model. It is, in my opinion, one of the cheapest ideas I've ever had to get a significant media attention behind me. And I have one person to thank for part of the idea. That's Christopher Tellen. He has a uh, roving co-host for me on this show, and I've been a guest on his podcast a couple of times. He's the one who said, hey, have you submitted any press releases? And I was really scared to do it. I had to find my way into it. But he's been on his local news station in Grand Rapids a couple of times to promote his book. And you'll have to reach out to him to ask him how much it's actually led to more book sales. But I'll tell you what. It's a really cool idea, and if you lean into it and make a habit of it, it's a, a talent that's going to pay dividends as well as an opportunity to get in front of people who are interested in what you're doing without having to pay anything. You don't pay to be a guest on a news program to talk about your book, to talk about brews for books. You get that for free because they're looking for things in the news to cover, so that's what you get out of this. And you probably remember that old cliched line about different tools. It's fairly common. People will say like, hey, if you're a hammer, you're not going to be able to cut through a tree. And if you're saw, you're not going to be able to pound a nail. This is like that in the way that Books for Brews is a great tool if you're looking for exposure. It's a terrible tool if you're looking for income. So just make sure you're using the right tools when you're approaching things. And by now, I think you most likely are asking the really important and timely question, what does this have to do with libraries? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Thanks for asking, Bob. I'm going to tell you right now. This is the tool, <laughs> the very, very effective, useful tool called Social Proof. Social Proof is the number one thing libraries want from you. Anywhere else you go, you're going to be looking for something else. Social Proof is the grease that lubes a lot of wheels. Yes, I said lube. It's the power that moves the engine's pistons, but only libraries stop with social proof. If you're going to go to a Barnes & Noble to try to get your books on the shelves, they're going to want hard sales statistics. That's not social proof because social proof can be free to everybody. Social proof can be inexpensive to everybody. Social proof can be really expensive to everybody. But social proof is how it moves people. You can sell a lot of books by advertising on Facebook. And we opened up this episode with an ad for author marketing mastery through optimization. I don't care what kind of author you are. And I'm going to be on the level with you because this is A, it's the power of ammo, but B, it's the dirty truth of the world. If you know how to advertise, you can sell anything. 
If you know how to advertise, you can sell anything, but you cannot be a long-term answer for anyone unless what you have has social proofability. Provability. Unless what you have is a social goodness. All right, so write great books. Not only will you sell a ton through ammo and advertising and learning how to advertise, but you will build lifelong fans. Libraries work a little bit different. They don't care how many sales you have necessarily, though we're, we're going to get to a point where sales is of, well, anyways, just just stay with me, okay? Golly, you guys jump ahead and it. it's really tough to, to finish a thought with all these questions you keep throwing at me in my mind. <laughs> I probably need to go in and get like some kind of counseling to figure out how I'm hearing my audience comments while I'm recording the episode. Take a deep breath. Social proof is that thing that proves you've got something for the community. And Books for Brews is really high on the social proof chart. What's happening is you are creating an alert. You're putting a beacon out there and you're, you're calling all of your people. It's the bat signal. Hey, we need action. And if it's done well, which I'm in the early stages, that's why this is all kind of, you get to watch and see how well it works for me. But if it's done well, if it targets the right way, if it gets enough volume, then a whole bunch of people who like coffee and enjoy books show up to the event. You end up selling a thousand cups of coffee and a thousand books. Then you go on to the bar, you sell another thousand books and a thousand beers. Everybody's good and drunk. You don't drive home because you're responsible, but you have a great book. You take your Uber and remember the night forever. And then (laughs) <laughs> that's not the end of the story. That was a really fun part. When you wake up with hangover, you have to take your vitamin C and drink a lot of water or just don't drink. That's great too. Then the next part of the process starts. And this is why it is great. Okay. I think it was Archimedes. If it wasn't Archimedes, it was Henry Ford said, give me a big enough lever and I can drive the industrial revolution. I'll say that for you again. Give me a big enough lever and I can move the world. This is a lever for social proof. And what it's going to do for you is that now you have what I call the it moment of your email marketing campaign for libraries. Last week, we talked about approaching individual libraries, talking to your librarians in your town, in your city, the ones that you can walk to, building that relationship, And even donating a copy, if that's what it takes, so that you can get that number, you know, the book associated with a library number, a catalog number, and then you can start to individually go and talk to library patrons and say, hey, I noticed you're hanging out in mystery. Why don't you check out this book that I wrote? It's free to you, and I think you'll really love it. It's actually set in this city, but that's only going to work somewhere around 20 or 30 times, depending on how many branches you have within driving distance of you. After that, you need to have the next thing. And the next thing is going to be twofold, okay? So the first one is you've been going into those libraries, building those relationships, getting people to check out your books. It's moving pretty slowly. If that's the only thing you were doing, you would probably need about eight years to get decent library penetration. What a word, all right? If you do something like Books for Brews, we are talking almost instantaneous regional penetration. (laughs) You're welcome. You're going to go into those libraries and you're going to be able to lead. And when I say go in, by the way, I mean, in this case, an email, you're going to be able to lead with, I was able to drive a community event that had 2000 people attend over a one, two, three, five day uh, books for brews event. Can you imagine? And it doesn't have to be that big. Mine probably is not going to be that big. I I like to think in big numbers because it keeps me moving. I think it's pretty realistic to think that I might be able to drive 100 human beings into a coffee shop and another 100 human beings into uh, a, a, a bar if I do things right per event. But I'll be able to get in front of a lot of people. And if the library knows that I can drive 200 people to an event surrounding my book, How likely do you think it is that they're going to take the opportunity to buy my book and add it to their catalog? I can do that remotely 
through an email. And once I'm added to their catalog, then I can start working and massaging the population to check out the book, to have a look at it, to see what's going on. It's a free resource to them, but it pays me, especially if it's an audiobook. And we're definitely going to be doing an episode dedicated to audiobook acquisition because it's really expensive to get a great one produced compared to everything else that you will do. But it is also the most lucrative avenue into a library. If you are able to get your book in the Hoopla uh, catalog for a library, it's a pay-to-play kind of a situation. Every time somebody checks it out, you're going to get between $1 and $3. Uh, if you do good at getting market penetration, third time, you're welcome, third time's a charm, uh, you are going to see some really amazing results. People are going to be checking out that book. And it's not like a physical copy where you have to wait for the next patron, but infinite numbers of people can check out your book if it's part of the Hoopla collection or any other pay-to-play type of library resource. That stuff adds up really quickly. So I hope that you are motivated by this episode to think outside the box, to try your own thing. Maybe you don't want to do the books for brews. If you do, I probably should copyright it because if you're smart, you're going to try to race me to the copyrighted books for brews and pretend that you came up with it and I'm stealing from you. Uh, with that in mind, today is June 16th, 2023. You think I'm kidding. Try to copyright it now. <laughs> books for brews. I should have looked this up online actually because maybe somebody's already copyrighted it and I'm stealing from them right now. In that case, I hope I get big enough that they sue me because I'd have to get pretty big to be even discovered and, and of a concern. At any rate, that's what I've got for you this week. One more call here. Okay, join Ammo if you want to start selling books immediately. It's a great thing to do. If you have amazing fiction written and you're willing to do some hard work to set up an advertising system and learn how it goes, you're going to be amazingly well set up to have a successful career as an author. Uh, follow along with this library process. That's going to be great. Do remember if you click on the link in my show notes and you sign up for Ammo, you're going to help support the podcast because just a small portion of each sign up through my show goes to support my livelihood, my three sons, my two cats, my one dog, and most importantly, my beautiful, talented, smart, lovely partner, Ashley. She makes everything better, including this podcast. You might not know it, but she does in a whole bunch of silent ways. So join Ammo. Uh, and then last but not least, homework. I've been trying to give you homework on these library episodes. So the homework right now is to identify 10 locations in your city or town that would be good to partner with should you ever do an event that is not a book signing at a bookshop, uh, anything like that. Uh, and, and with that in mind, homework-wise, Chris Talon sells a goodly number of books. When I say goodly, I don't. he won't tell me exactly how many copies, but we'll call it goodly uh, just by partnering with, uh, I think they're called pot shops. I think that's what they're called. It's legal, recreational, recreationable, recreationable cannabis. I'm probably on it right now. No, I don't use cannabis. I don't like it. I use lots of other things though. Uh, why do I do this? Okay. Homework is find five to 10 locations that you can partner with if you wanted to do your spin on Books for Brews. Let me know. I would love to hear from you. I would love for you to drop a comment. If you're not signed up for Substack, sign up for it right now and drop me a comment. Let me know. Where would you go? Who would you talk to to partner to do something like Books for Brews in your town? Give me ideas. Let's let's exchange them. I gave you my best ideas. Throw them back my way. You can email me at jodyjsperling at gmail.com. I got a bunch of different email addresses. You can probably find them all if you're out there. That's what I got for you. Stay safe and we'll talk to you again on Wednesday. Thank you for listening to TRBM. The theme music was provided by the ever-talented Christopher Talon. And hey, if you liked what you heard, share this show with other readers because what's the point of telling stories if nobody's listening? <laughs>